Brian J. Jones is an American biographer primarily of American pop culture icons. And he's written the Jim Henson biography, one of his many biographies, which I've spent the last week or so reading. And he's with us now to talk about it. How are you doing today? I am doing absolutely great, Toby. It's so great to talk to you. Yeah. Now, first of all, why did you choose to write about Jim Henson. Were you a Muppets fan or Sesame Street fan, fan of his work? Yeah, no, I'm I'm uh, sort of, you know, Muppet generation 1.0 in a way, because, you know, I didn't realize until I started researching it that the Muppets had been on the Jimmy Dean show back in the 60s and so on, but I was Sesame Street generation one. So like I had Muppets in front of me from the time I was, you know, two years old and then was nine when the Muppet show came out, sort of the, you know, the best age for the Muppets at that point. So I had always grown up with the Muppets. He was one of those subjects I wasn't necessarily looking to write about. And I wish I had a great story for how I arrived on it. But I do remember being on his Jim Henson's Wikipedia page Uh and reading it and going, gee, why is there no biography of Jim? Mm. Uh, And that was sort of how I started that journey on, you know, reaching out to the Henson family and so on. I don't remember why I was on that page. I wish I could remember that. But I do remember thinking, God, you know, reading something going, where did they get that and going to the bottom and, and realizing, wow, there's no biography of him. Mm. And when you were on his page, did you find anything that struck a chord with you maybe and made you want to write the biography? Or was it just the fact that there wasn't one already done before? Well, when I realized there wasn't one, that was the biography I wanted to write. I mean, when I was, you know, when I was a teenager, I used to I used to always check out of the library. There's a great book called um, of Muppets and Men. It was all about the making of the Muppet oh, yeah. Show. And I, lo- and I loved that book. I always liked the behind the scenes stuff. Um, so, you know, he was one of those subjects that once I knew there wasn't a book and, you know, I was going to, you know, elbow anybody out of the way I had to, to mm-hmm. get the, the opportunity to write that book. It was just, it was a, a dream subject for me. So, uh, mm. it was a privilege and an honor to be able to write that book. Was there any way of knowing whether or not somebody else was already <laughs> in the process of writing a book about him? Well, that's what you have agents for. Yeah, <laughs> so, right. you know, I reached out to my agent and I said, I was like, you know, I said, I can't believe somebody's not doing this. This was about 2006. So Jim Mm. had been dead 15, 16 years at that point. I said, I can't believe, you know, can you check and see if there's a Robert Caro who's been writing about (laughs) Jim for, you know, 25 years here and we just don't know about it. And so he, you know, worked his magic and came back and said, no, I can't, you know, nothing's been sold. I can't find anything in the works. And so that was when I kind of knew there was an opportunity. I actually started by going over to the University of Maryland Mm -hmm. and and talking with the archivist there at the film collection, because I was actually nervous that maybe he was working on one. He was a lovely guy, but I, and I went over and spoke with him and we talked about Jim for about 20 minutes. But the real question I wanted to ask him, you know, I finally said, well, given everything that we've talked about, why is there no biography of Jim? And then I was holding my breath thinking he was going to say, well, actually, I've been working on a biography of Jim for two. Anyway, didn't say, he just looked at me and said, you know, I don't, I don't know the answer to that, so, which was the answer I wanted. Yeah, it does seem really strange that there wasn't one of him, but I suppose someone has to do it and it fell to you. Yeah, and, and like I said, I felt so privileged uh, to be able to do it because, you know, everybody still loves talking about Jim and they still mm. definitely feel that loss, um, even talking about it 15, 20 years later. Yeah. How long did it take you to do all the research for the book? Because it's so detailed and you've got so many quotes from people who I think some of them you've met up with and interviewed them yourself. So was that quite a long process to get all these facts and perspectives together? Yeah, it was about a three, it was a five-year project total, but I spent it probably the first two years convincing the Hensons to let me do it. <laughs> so once they said yes, it was about a three-year process of researching and interviewing and then writing it. Um, actually, one of the first places I ever interviewed anybody was in London. I interviewed mm-hmm. um, Jocelyn Stevenson, who was one of the writers mm-hmm. on Fraggle Rock in her flat there in London. So one of the first people I interviewed was right over there. And, and I happened to be in London in 2009. And I went up to go see Elstree Studios and just Ooh. kind of walk around and you know see where Jim had worked and where he had lived when he was there and his the house he lived on over in, near Hampstead Heath. And so I spent a little time in, in the UK anyway, um, talking to a couple of people, you know, Louise Gold, who was uh, mm, one of his yeah. performers who's, who's English. Uh, I actually did her over Skype. But oh. um, but, you know, Jim, Jim, Jim was 
Jim loved England. He loved Hampstead Heath, and he actually used to keep a calendar so he m- could make sure he was not in the UK more than six months in a day, so his tax rate didn't change yeah. <laughs> to a foreign rate. <laughs> but, but anyway, so it was it was three years of doing all that work, and a lot of it was just embedding myself in the Henson archives, which are in Long Island City, New York, and just you know for weeks at a time, and just pulling boxes down and going through you know contracts and papers after papers and handwritten notes and turning everything over to see. If if there was anything on the back where you know nobody thought anyone would ever be looking. Yeah. Um, when you're a biographer, the archives are the fun part. That's part the stuff you just don't want to let go of. It, it's mm-hmm. actually hard to know when you want to start writing because the research is so great and so much fun. And as you can imagine with Jim Henson, the research is particularly fun. Yeah, um, it must be. I don't know how much of Elstree Studios you saw, but I heard a rumor that Statler and Waldorf's balcony is still there. I don't know if you're able to corroborate that. <laughs> I, I can't corroborate that. I, I, I don't know. I know that it was the same stage where Morecambe and Wise filmed. Yeah. Um, so, it, you know, another very well-loved show. And then, you know, here comes the Muppets taking in that stage. But I, I don't know if the Statler World, I would love to, I would love to hope that, I hope that's true. Mm. Um, I can't confirm it. Yeah. And that studio has been used for so much. It's incredible that the studio for the Muppet Show is now where the BBC do their live election coverage. Which... Oh, I didn't know that. That is interesting. Yeah. And, and right across the street from Elstree Movie Studios, where at the time Jim was doing The Muppet Show, George Lucas was actually filming a movie he was convinced would make no money called Star Wars. Yeah, so much history. And you mentioned about getting permission from the Hensons. Why do you think it took a couple of years for them? Were they just a bit hesitant because, you know, their father is such a legendary figure and they wouldn't want to kind of damage the reputation, I suppose? Well, I, th- I think they wanted to be sure whoever was doing it wanted to do it right Mm. um um and you know wasn't up to shenanigans and didn't have any sort of an agenda they were going to try to press through um so what what ultimately broke it open for me is so my my background is i worked in the u.s senate (laughs) for about a decade back in the 90s but your job as a senate staffer is to is essentially reportage and research and you know your boss says i would like information on something and you go out and you get you know pros and cons on both sides of an issue and you talk with people and get people's positions and you outline things in detail and then compress all that information down. And it was actually really good practice for biography. Mm. And I had written one biography earlier on Washington Irving that I sent to them, um, which I found out later they liked very much. And that did half of my job for (laughs) me. But, but, but the main thing I did that I think really made the difference is, you know, they're a Hollywood family. So I wanted to audition for them at least as well as I could as a biographer. And it wasn't a movie I made, but I went down, I lived near Washington, D.C., and I went down to the Library of Congress and I pulled every newspaper article I could find on Jim when he was first breaking into television while he was still in high school mm. um, there in the Washington, D.C. area. So I pulled every newspaper article I could find about him and people talking about how you know he was 18 years old and people were calling him a genius already. Wow. Um, so I wrote just this, this mock chapter on Jim Henson at the University of Maryland and in Northwestern High School, making salmon friends there at the local NBC station. It was actually very familiar for me to do because I lived there. Yeah. So it, you know, it felt like I was at home. And I sent them that chapter and I said, this is this is the way I would do this. You know, obviously I'm going to have more information if you let me do this. I can get more of Jim's voice into it and people who knew him. But this is the way I would do this. I, as a biographer, I view my job as trying to get out of your way. I want to try to let him tell the story as much as I can. This is the way I would do this. And when I sent that to them, that was immediately the moment they said, we, we get it. Now we see it. This is the way we envision this project taking place, yeah. the way this is working. Lisa Henson had said to me at one time, you know, if we don't let you do this because what I really needed was their archives. And mm. she said, if we don't let you do this, are you going to try to write it anyway? And I said, mm. you know, I don't, I don't think I can because you guys, you know, it's like the end of Raiders of the Lost Ark when everything's in the warehouse. I said, you guys own everything. You know, Jim's papers aren't at the University of Maryland. Yeah. They're not at the University of Connecticut where the big puppetry program is. They're privately held uh, at the Jim Henson company. You have to have their permission to access them. So I couldn't really do it the way I want to. And I, and I loved you saying that you felt it was very detailed because that's the kind of information you can only get from sitting there embedded inside their archives. Yeah, absolutely. I never knew that you used to work in the Senate. That means that you definitely know what you're talking about in your tweets then. 
<laughs> Sometimes yeah, but I can get to, I'm constantly running my mouth about the about the way that institution is run right now, yeah. that's for sure. Now when you were researching, did you find out any facts or really surprising information that just isn't on the internet anywhere at all? Well, I mean on the personal side of things, um I had no idea about Jim and Jane's relationship and mm. how sort of fractious that could be at times and how, you know, Jim's probably biggest Achilles heel is he was not faithful to his wife. Mm. Um, I didn't know that. Most people who knew Jim did know that. Uh, everyone mm. in the family knew that. Jane, his widow, was the first person who told me that. So it wasn't like some big secret. Um, but as someone on the outside, I didn't know any of that. So that was one of those issues that you, you know, you had to be delicate with because when I sent the early drafts into the Hensons, here was this stranger repeating these stories back to them in third person, which I'm sure was very odd for them. Yeah. Um, but to their credit, you know, they they knew about it and they thought I had handled it tastefully. So it, it stayed, you know, we I left it in. They, the, the book was not authorized in the sense that they could torpedo anything that they didn't like. Um, but they, you know, I, I worked very closely with them. I wanted their input onto it. I really valued their involvement. I think it makes it a better book for that. Um, so that was one element I didn't know. The other th things I didn't realize was just how Jim inherently knew that his work had value mm. from a very early age. Yeah. You know, very early on, he creates Rolf the dog for a commercial uh, for a Canadian dog food company. And they offer to buy Rolf from him outright uh, <laughs> for a lot of money, you know, like six figures in the early 1960s. And Jim refuses to do that. Yeah. Uh, and tells his agent, Bernie Brilstein, never sell anything I own. Mm. Jim just inherently knew that his work had value and was actually an extraordinarily good businessman before because of that. We always picture him because he looks sort of like this laid back hippie is having sort of this lazy, fair business acumen. Um, Jim wasn't a great manager because he tended to view his employees as family. But as yeah. far as his business sense, it was actually really extraordinarily good. Uh, so that was that was something that really surprised me as well. Mm. And Jane Henson died the year that this book was released and Jerry Nelson the year before. Right. So did they get the chance to have her read it, some sort of draft of the book? Jane did. Jerry didn't, oh. which makes me very sad. Um, Jane had a chance. Like Jane was Jane was actually one of the first people I even interviewed. And I think I yeah. sat with her for something like seven and a half hours. And she <laughs> was just she was a pistol um, and talked to her repeatedly. So she she got to read the early drafts. In fact, one of the things I loved love about Jane is after she read the the very first draft of it, I came again to meet with her in person in New, in New York City. Yeah. And she was sitting at this table in their offices there in the city and with her arms folded, just acid, acid, angry at me. And and I said, uh, you know, what what's wrong? She said, you made me sound too damn important. <laughs> and, and I said, Jane, you know, I've, I've watched your videos. I've watched tapes of your performance. There's a reason Jim chose you as his first partner. Forget yeah. marrying you. There's a reason you were first partner. You're really good at this. Uh, and so I finally was able to talk her down and, you know, I, le I, I left all of that stuff in there, but she was, you know, she was, she was very modest about it. She knew she was important, but she was very modest about it. But boy, she, after she read that first draft, she came right up out of the chair uh, but then calmed down afterwards and was very funny about it. So, so I was really glad she got to read it. Jerry, I wish had had an opportunity to. Um, I hadn't finished it at the time Jerry passed. Yeah, and some people who did read it included Frank Oz and Dave Goals and Fran Brill, who've put in their own kind of comments on the book. How does it feel to get positive comments from people who knew Jim so well? It feels great because. Um, you know, this was a project that when I was researching and writing, I would wake up every morning and look at myself in the mirror and say out loud to myself, do not mess this up. Yeah. Um, because it's it was important. I mean, not just to me, but to people who know Jim and to Jim's legacy. And, you know, it was a story I wanted to get right. It was a story I wanted to be fair about. It was a story I wanted to do justice to. So it made me really happy when people who worked with them, who had spoken with me and knew what I was up to, but who, when yeah. they read the final product, Dave Goals, for example, is, is lovely. He'll he'll email me every year and say, I just read it again. And every time I read it, I learned something new. It's just great. So I, I love hearing that. Um, David Laser, who was Jim's producer, who I didn't get the opportunity to interview in person um, mm. because he was he's ill and he's hard to reach. He's down in Florida. I actually got a note from him mm. after the book came out where he said, Brian, you got him. You got his essence, which I just absolutely love. So that makes me very happy because, again, when you're a biographer, you're you're trying to view their, especially with a creative type. Let me, let me say this. 
um, when you write about creative people, you're trying to view their work through the prism of their life and their life through the prism of their work, which is a very <laughs> delicate dance. Um, so it makes me very happy that people think that I got him and, you know, warts and all in some places even. Uh, so I, th th that makes me extraordinarily happy to know that. Yeah. A lot of people sometimes compare Jim Henson to Kermit the Frog himself and others say that Rolf is probably his closest character. Do you think that his personality matches any of the characters he did for maybe <laughs> people to kind of get a picture of what he was like? Great question. So I, th I think, I think, I think later in his life, Jim was most closely aligned with Kermit. Um, mm -hmm. And I think the reason we all think that is because Kermit's the eye of the hurricane. Yeah. And Jim himself was always the eye of the hurricane. And uh, Kermit gets a little more wigged out than Jim does. Jim never really blows his cool the way Kermit can. That's one of the things that makes Kermit so funny. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, he's the eye of the hurricane. And Kermit at one point says, everyone thinks I'm not crazy, but I'm the one that hired all these guys. <laughs> yeah. I, I think I think Jim would say that was a fair cop for him. He hired all these Muppet maniacs. But I actually think the character that is closest to him is Rolf. Um, yeah. Rolf is a little more laid back. He's a little more homespun. Kermit was Jim's ability to be snarky, um, which Jim himself really was not. So I think with Kermit yeah. on his arm, he could do that. Rolf was never really snarky. Rolf was going to, you know, maybe get off one of the clever Bon Mots or something, but was not yeah. necessarily snarky, a lot more homespun. I think Rolf is much closer to Jim than Kermit is. Would you say there is a character Jim did that's the furthest away from him? Because I mean, <laughs> Dr. Teeth probably vocally. <laughs> Um, it's it's hard to say because yeah. I think I think the I think you can't perform a character well if there's not a little bit of you in there. Yeah. Um, like one of my favorite characters that Jim does is Guy Smiley. Yeah. Um, and you might think, well, that's not really Jim, but Guy Smiley is actually Jim, like an amped up version of Jim. Like who, whatever game you're playing is the greatest game there is to be playing. You know, that's <laughs> that's kind of Jim's for even the Swedish Chef. There's a little bit of oh, Jim yeah. in that, which is kind of let's just go nuts. Mm -hmm. um, and then you take a character like Kansas from Fraggle Rock, and that character right there is Jim. You know, again, the very low key, um, you know, says very clever, interesting things that you're not precisely sure what they necessarily mean, but they yeah. sound very deep and interesting. Um, so, so no, I don't really think, and I think that's probably true of any Muppet performer. The only way you can perform a character believably if there's a nugget of you in there. The one furthest from him is probably the Swedish chef, just because there's not a lot of personality there. It's more yeah. just going nuts. Um, but again, Jim loved going nuts, and Jim loves ending sketches with things getting eaten or exploding, <laughs> and that is that is the Swedish chef's you know mo right there. Yeah, if you're writing a sketch and you can't figure out how to end it, you just blow something up. No, it's like the pythons. You know, you drop the sixteen-ton yeah. weight on them. I mean, Jim loved Python. I think because they had they had the same mentality right there. We can't figure out in the sketch. We're going to drop a sixteen-ton weight on you, or a monster will appear and eat you. Mm -hmm. Either either one worked. Yeah. Another thing that surprised me in the book is Sesame Street was such a big part of his career and what a lot of people remember him for. But he only spent about a week or two a year actually filming his stuff for it. Yeah, they did what they called the inserts, mm. uh, all those little Muppet segments of letters and numbers or interacting with children. Um, they would they tended to go in for about two weeks a year and just knock all those out at one time, yeah. mostly because Jim's schedule was just so crazy, especially during the Muppet Show era when he was in the UK half the time. Mm -hmm. um, but it was important to him. He always made sure he had time to go back and do it. Um, he was, you know, he was very actively involved in the development assessment. He wasn't, I, I always see people talk about the founder of Sesame Street. So yeah. Jim wasn't really that, but he was, he was the person they knew they had to have to make Sesame Street work. Um, and it came at a point in his career when Jim was doing all sorts of, it. The, the 60s is such an interesting period in Jim's career because he's got so many different balls in the air. Um, you know, he's trying to open sort of an adult theme nightclub at one point, oh, yeah. and he's making he's making a film like Timepiece, and he's doing you know the Cube, this sort of esoteric Twilight Zone kind of thing, and he's doing documentaries, and the Muppets are on the list of many things that he does, but Jim isn't quite sure where he wants to land. And then Sesame Street comes along in 1969, and he goes all in because mm -hmm. part partly because he he liked that Sesame Street was making 
TV matter. Jim loved TV. And that was at the point when Neil Minow was calling TV the vast wasteland. Uh, Jim loved TV. And it was great to him that TV was going to matter. But he also really believed in that mission as well, uh, in educating kids and talking directly to kids. He really liked what Sesame Street was doing. So he was all in very early on and doing what we call the Baker films, which I was, you know, three when Sesame Street first one on there and I yeah. loved the Baker films with the guy falling down the stairs. So so Sesame Street was really important to him, but but that's kind of the moment too it it in a way defined him then as the puppeteer, which wasn't necessarily what he wanted to do with his career. But once that happened, again, he was all in on it. Uh he, you know, he became Jim Henson puppeteer. Even as once we got the success of the Muppets in place, that's when he starts reaching out to do things like the Dark Crystal and Labyrinth and sort of pushing those boundaries then to go back th- going back almost to the way he looked in the 60s in a sense yeah with sesame street he was kind of being profiled as this kids entertainer how hard do you think it was for him to kind of get that perception away from him well i i I think it was hard and i think it was a little frustrating for him uh to again not just to be pigeonholed as a puppeteer but as a children's puppeteer (laughs) because jim never really thought of himself as a performer solely for children um, one of the things he was always trying to pitch and make clear when he was proposing the Muppet Show is the, the term he kept using is family entertainment. Meaning, yeah. you know, there's going to be there, there might be a joke that's going to go over the heads of the kids, but the adults will get it. Yeah. And you know, it was one of those. That was one of the things that made the Muppet Show great was that it worked on so many different levels. But Jim was really trying to. You know, break out of that mold. And when Sesame Street landed, I, you know, it was the double whammy of not just are you the puppeteer now, you're the children's puppeteer. Mm-hmm. Um, I think that was one of the reasons why he was so attracted to Saturday Night Live, taking that job right away in like, you know, 75. Sesame Street was about four years old. Yeah. Uh, you know, it was on at 1130 at night over here. It was sort of buried, you wow. know, at, at the late time. And they were doing some very experimental things with the Muppets on Saturday Night Live with that Los Land of Gorch sketches. Didn't necessarily work, but it was Jim doing something new and different. I mean, I was nine when that came out yeah. or eight, and I used to stay up wow. to watch it because it was the Muppets. And then I watched it and I was like, I don't, I don't get it. But, <laughs> but I stayed up to watch it because I knew it was Jim Henson. Are shows on really late in America? Because all these late night shows seem to be on at half 11 and nothing's on the TV at that late over here. Right. Yeah. And it, 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 it was yeah very, very late. And so they were trying to get away with some. It was a time when yeah. you could experiment some, some things. And Saturday Night Live, I mean, didn't look like anything else at the time, especially too. So, yeah. Now, The Muppet Show is coming to Disney Plus this week, finally. Do you have any favourite episodes that you'd recommend to people who are maybe discovering it for the first time? So I love, there's a couple that I love, and there's a difference between which ones are the ones you should watch right away versus the ones that I love. I mean, maybe that disclaimer first, but I love the Steve Martin episode. Steve Martin is one of those guys that really gels with the Muppets. And that's one of those episodes that was filmed live in the sense that when he's performing on stage and you hear people laughing, it's not a laugh track. Oh. It's actually the Muppet performers audibly cracking up while Steve Martin's performing. So oh, watch yeah. that one. And the laughter you hear is actually the Muppet performers laughing, not a laugh track. Um, I love the episode with Mark Hamill where we get the Star Wars crossover. Oh, yeah. Um, and Jim ended up working later on with George Lucas. Uh, Yoda is a creation, a joint creation of Jim Henson and George Lucas, as performed by Frank Oz. But yeah. uh, it was the Henson Company in the Lucas film. The Harry Belafonte episode I always recommend because um, it's very important to Jim. Mm. Uh, that episode was one. Of, he, first of all, he loved Harry Belafonte. When he and Jane went out in one of their very first dates, they went to a Harry Belafonte concert. Mm-hmm. Uh, so Jim's relationship yeah. with Harry Belafonte went back further than Harry's did with Jim. Yeah. Um, um, but um, but there's a really wonderful moment in there called Turn the World Around, uh, and it's all oh, about yeah. the earth and the sea and the sky. And uh, after Jim passed, Harry Belafonte performed that song at Jim's uh, memorial service. So so it, it's one of those when you're watching it, it sort of has a full circle um, ending to it, if you know that mm. that was performed later. But a, a beautiful episode, uh, a really important message to Jim. It sort of embodies his own view of his work and his own view of the world as well. So that's that's another sort of must watch. Elton John, oh, I can yeah. never not say enough about Elton John. Alice Cooper makes a surprisingly mm. fantastic 
fantastic appearance on The Muppet Show. Uh, very silly. People didn't know what to expect out of Alice Cooper with that fantastic episode there. Lots of really great episodes. Gene Kelly is a great episode. Um, there's just, you really can't go wrong. If you would ask me my top five episodes, I'd tell you there's 120 episodes on it. Yeah, for sure. Now, you yourself have written other biographies, of course, including George Lucas and Dr. Seuss. Do you like to stick to creative people? I, I do. Um, now, they happen to all be men, um, and that was not intentional. I would love to write a woman's story. I'm working on trying to find the right subject that I fit for as well on that. Mm -hmm. But um, I love the creative game changers, um, the people who you know break open their chosen genre in ways people hadn't thought of. And even my first book, which is Washington Irving, is kind of in the same zone there. Irving was our first American short story writer, actually kind of invented viral marketing in 1807 without wow. really knowing what that, that that was the word for it. Um, but so I, I love I love writing and learning about the creative process. I was one of these kids and then adults who was like always would watch the behind the scenes featurettes on anything. Oh, How does man. stuff work? I love knowing that. And so I really love the, you know, to be the fly on the wall when the creative process is going on and just writing about and learning about these, you know, big creative game changers is uh, is my shelf, which I didn't realize I had my editor use that term with me and I didn't realize, yeah, I have a shelf and that's it. Yeah, The Muppets is probably the best thing to watch the behind the scenes of, although there doesn't seem to be much of it. I think these days Disney are very secretive about revealing that the Muppets are actually puppets. Yeah, the you know the the DVDs of the Muppet Show actually, I think the season three DVD has the making of the Muppet Show featurette on it, oh, the ninety yeah. minute of Muppets and Men. So you can see that there. I'm hoping Disney will drop some of those little bonus features on as extras yeah, on hopefully. there. I you know Jim Jim was never precious with the process. He didn't have any problem going on. You know, go to YouTube and 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 type in Jim Henson Johnny Carson, and you see him on Johnny Carson with Kermit the Frog on his arm. <laughs> so, you know, Jim didn't have any problem problem with the puppeteer being seen kind of ahead of his time in a sense mm -hmm. uh, because now we see that in the Lion King and Avenue Q and so on and we don't even think twice about it but Jim it never really bothered him now mm -hmm. Toby what's your favorite episode of the Muppet show I don't know I kind of like the Kenny Rogers episode because of the music and stuff yeah. I like the lime and the coconut and <laughs> the joke at the start when Kermit's on the flying trapeze and is like don't push me hard what <laughs> push me hard <laughs> And the subject of talk shows, I think maybe the reason Jim Henson did it and it hasn't been done since is maybe that everybody knew Jim Henson, but not many people know Steve Wetmire or Matt Vogel that aren't Muppet fans, really. Yeah, I mean, you... It, it... That's a good point, and it's it's interesting. So Frank Oz did the documentary Muppet Guys Talking a couple of years ago, mm. um, where it was sort of what we consider the you know the first generation, the the you know Star Trek the the original series, so to speak, yeah. of Muppet performers. <laughs> you know, it was Frank, and it was you know Dave Goals, and so on. So so I think we tend to know those original performers. I, a lot of Muppet fans know the names of the performers, but you're right. There's there's yeah. not the, they don't make the rounds and yeah, Steve's not on a talk show. Matt Vogel isn't on the talk show with Kermit on his arm talking. I Yeah, it, it'd be interesting to see if they decide to do something like that. I'd watch it. Yeah, it would be certainly interesting. I don't know. So this station is based in Blackpool. So a lot of people might be interested in the fact that the Muppets actually lit up the Blackpool lights for, was it the 100th anniversary of it? I think so. Um, that is a memory to this day that Dave Goals, who does Gonzo, still lights up at. Yeah. He loved coming. Jim loved coming up there. He loved the lights. He loved the whole show. He loved the patchery. That was right up Jim Henson's alley. Dave Goals still vibrates talking <laughs> about how exciting that was and how much fun it was. So, uh, so yeah, that was one of those one of those trips that Jim was really excited to make. He was also at uh, at the Queen's twenty uh, fifth, I think. Uh, was when that came out. Anyway, uh, Jim Jim sort of made the rounds on all the all the ceremonies there in the UK. He really yeah. loved living there and being a part of the community. But boy, those Blackpool lights, like I said, Dave Goals still to this day just loves uh, oh, the wow. memories of that that. Yeah. How many ski holidays did Jim Henson go on? Because I should maybe have another read of the book and tally them all up. <laughs> Uh, you know, great question. I've never counted that. And and don't forget, there's also the hot air balloon holiday at oh, one yeah. point. There's the charter the yacht holiday at one point. Um, oh. I love that his daughter, Heather, 
um, the youngest daughter, always talks about how, you know, he was very simple in some ways. And then when it came to vacations, he could be completely over the top, <laughs> which, is cer- which is certainly true. And, you know, rent- renting hot air balloons so everybody, hit, you know, all the Muppet performers and their friends can go hot air ballooning over the, you know, the French Alps. Oh, yeah. Uh, that's a very Jim henson vacation. But no, great question. I didn't actually count them up. Hmm. And they were never more than a few days because he was always working on something. So busy, yeah. Yeah. The Dark Crystal and Labyrinth didn't really have a great reception to start off with. At the time, did you enjoy those films or have you grown to enjoy them? You know, I... I... So I, I saw them both in the theater. Lisa Henson's so funny. I told her, I, I think part of my cred for it was I, I actually saw Labyrinth in the theater. I was a freshman in college. Oh. And her funny response was, oh, you were the one. <laughs> um, so, you know, that, I mean, they're, they're, they're very funny about it now. But the, at the time, Jim was very hurt by the fact that nobody really got it. Yeah. And nobody saw it. Dark Crystal, I did see in the theater as well. Um, as I told Lisa Henson, I was part of their problem. Um, I yeah. think I was 12. 12 when dark crystal came out or 13 and i came out of dark crystal scratching my head Hmm. because jim it was something so new and different i wasn't ready for it yet uh like i said i was part of their problem and poor jim when he's out promoting the dark crystals is spending half of his time answering the question where are the muppets (laughs) where are the muppets um we weren't ready to let him grow up in a sense. And so he's, you know, he's still doing these, these really incredibly innovative things. One of the wonderful things about dark crystal and labyrinth as well, although there, although it's got a little bit more of a, you know, flashy effects in it, Mm. everything in dark crystal is built. Yeah. Um, You know, there's no CGI in dark crystal. I think there's a sky that's laid in at one point, but for the most part, everything you see on screen in dark crystal exists. And everybody talked about how you could walk through the set and go around the back and the backside of the sets was finished um you know and pixar always talks about painting the bottoms of the drawers in their cartoons that's how detailed they're the the sets in dark crystal were that way i mean everything was incredibly well thought out so you know jim as i always say about both dark crystal and labyrinth and this is especially true for labyrinth is jim was right about both those movies at the wrong time Um, Dark Crystal made its money back. Had Dark Crystal not made its money back, I don't think he would have been permitted then to make Labyrinth. Yeah. But when he makes Labyrinth, uh, that one just baffles people because is it is it a, a, a musical? Is it a comedy? Is it fantasy? Is it, you know, it's, mm. it's doing so many different things at once that it just, I, you know, it almost literally blew people's minds. That's one when I put my slides, when I talk about Jim Henson and I put my Labyrinth slide up on the wall, especially when I'm in front of college age audiences, the place goes nuts. Yeah. Um, they just love it. They found it. Again, Jim was right about it. They had to be found by people that would finally get it. People my age, when it first came out, we weren't quite sure what to make of it. Nowadays, I uh, mean, people see it exactly for what it is. It's a remarkable achievement. People love that movie. Mm. Are you working on any other books at the moment? Because I think you're probably due another one in a year or so. <laughs> yeah, I was just looking. that uh, I'm, I'm supposed to have one out every three years. Is what yeah. my timeline looks like. I actually do not have a project right now, which is <gasps> the longest I have ever gone uh, without having one. I had a project for about 20 seconds and then found out that somebody huge was doing the same subject and oh. I, uh, I won't reveal who that is, but I bow to this particular writer. So I, uh, I abandon my take on it because I will never be able to do it as well as this person. So, yeah. Well, if we're interested in buying this book or any other book that you've written, is there an official place to buy it? Uh, you can buy it from any of your favorite booksellers. I'm not picky about that. If you've got a uh, you know a, a local bookseller that you love, by all means go there. Everything I've written is still in print. So if they don't have it in the shop, they can order it. So support your local bookseller there. If you want to see what I've written, you can visit brianjjones.com. Spell out my middle name. Um, I ended up using my middle name because if you type Brian Jones, you get 300 website pages oh, wow. of the dead Rolling Stone. <laughs> um, so, so anyway, you can go to brianjjones.com and you can see all the books I've written. But again, uh, your local bookseller can order them if you can't find them. And uh, by all means, shop local. Yeah. Well, thank you very much for coming on the show today. It's very nice of you to take the time and some great conversations.